Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Bee Culture, the magazine of American beekeeping. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flottam. Today's podcast with Dan Conlon is sponsored by Dr. Larry Connors with Wasp Press. Dr. Connor has published over a dozen titles dealing with bees, beekeeping, queen rearing, and pollination. At the Wickwas Press site, you'll find a great selection of must-have books for beekeepers and people who love honeybees, such as Foraging Afar by William Bloomquist, Bee Cabulary Essentials by Andrew Connor, Garden Plants for Honeybees by Peter Lintner, Increase Essentials and Queen Rearing Essentials by Dr. Connor, and Swarm Essentials by Steve Rapaski with Dr. Connor. All of these and more are at www.wickwas.com. That's www.wicwas.com. Hey, and while you're there, be sure to thank Dr. Connor for sponsoring the Beekeeping Today podcast. I'm looking forward to today's podcast with Dan. Uh, reading about the Russian bees and, and, and how they can work for us would be, uh, it's going to be a fun thing to learn. And I've never had an experience with Russian bees, so this will, and, and con- considering today's political climate, it'll be a fun discussion. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've known, I've known Dan a long time, and, and uh, we've done some work with the Russian bee program in the past. And it is something that I'm, I am, I'll go right out on a limb and say a fierce advocate for here. I, I can't believe that it, I, I want it to work. And, and so we're, we keep pushing it here. So um, Dan Conlon is sitting out in Massachusetts. He's waiting for us to call, Jeff. All right, let's uh, dial him up on Zoom. Hi, Dan, how are you doing? I'm doing well. It's a lot of rain out here and uh, it's a good day to do this. Can't get much bee work done. It sounds like a whole lot of my my summer and fall so far, a whole lot of rain. I think I got two days off without rain, but of course I need hip boots to get out to the hive. So it's been an interesting fall trying to harvest it here, Dan. Uh, yeah, it has been uh, horrendous out here. We, uh, we're still trying to get bees out of the uh, the squash pollination, and there are fields that are so muddy, uh, you just can't even get oh, into the bee yards. Oh. Just, we've never never seen it like this. So we don't need more rain. <laughs> well, the voice of experience is I'm really sorry because I've been there and done that, and I don't want to do it again. So uh, good luck to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we'll get it done eventually. Well, Jeff, I brought... Uh, but we brought Dan on today, and, uh, and uh, boy, I mean, it's, it's real specific to talk about the Russian Bee, uh, Bee, Bee Breeders Association. Dan's the president. He's been a president for a couple, three years. We've done a couple programs with him. A couple, what was it a couple, three years ago, Dan, we had you guys out here? Yeah, yeah, that was, uh, I think, three years back. Yeah, we did a program called The Russians Are Coming Again, and we brought in all of the, all of the breeders, and they told about their program and how it was working. And I just want to update folks on that it's still going strong. Uh, Russian bees are still something to think about. And Dan, basically what I'm going to do is I'm just going to sit up here and ask you, can you tell me about the program, how it's working, and and uh, fill us in a little bit on both background and bring us up to date so then we can take a look into maybe a little bit of the future. And if I can just jump in there, before you get into the details, maybe uh, for the folks that don't know you, just give a little bit of background on what brought you to, to beekeeping and, and what interests you and why you're into the Russians, and then you can go into the might be fun like that. Okay. Right now, uh, my wife, Benita, and I, we run uh, Warm Colors Apiary in Western Massachusetts. And we've been full-time beekeepers since 2000. That's when we had had done a lot of sidelining kind of thing, kept 100 hives for many years. And I've actually kept bees since I was 14 in Ohio, I started. And uh, always had an interest in it. So Where in Ohio? uh, uh, Outside of Dayton, actually. out Centerville, Ohio, what south of there, between Centerville and Centerville and Cincinnati. All right, grew up in Huber Heights, so that's real. Oh yeah, I know Huber Heights well. Yeah. So for <laughs> sure. Like a lot of beekeepers, uh, I daydreamed for many years uh, the idea of being a uh, professional beekeeper and making my living with bees. And uh, we took the plunge when I turned fifty, 
So uh, it's been, uh, it's been, uh, haven't looked back with any regrets. A lot of work behind all of this, but, uh, but uh, we've, we've done pretty well and uh, we enjoy the lifestyle. So it's worked out very well for us. So that's great. How, how did you stumble into and get into the Russian bees? Well, when I, uh, in 2000, if you were keeping bees back then, you know that the mites were, were starting to become a, a big problem. We had the tracheal mites and the varroa mites. And, and up until that point, I actually am one of those guys who's kept bees before the damn mites, as Dewey Karen would tell you. And, uh, and I remember when you didn't put treatments on your hives for these kinds of things. So uh, when I started out, I had a a uh, lot of problem with the idea of using chemicals in my hives and I wanted something that was going to be an alternative. And I started reading, uh, you know, some of the early writings that Tom Rinderer, Dr. Rinderer from the bee lab in Baton Rouge was writing, which were uh, to explore the uh, honeybees uh, immune systems and behaviors and characteristics that help them counter threats. And, uh, and I started thinking this guy is sort of on to what I think is is the future, and uh, I kind of got interested in the Russians, and I got my first Russian queens from Charlie Harper in Louisiana, and then I also got some from Tom Glenn, who was of course a, a well known uh, breeder of queens, good queens, and uh, I started using those early on, and found quite early on that uh, they did have a better success rate with the mites. They had mite issues, but uh, they didn't get tracheal mites at all. And uh, in the Varroa, they, uh, you know, they seem to do better than the bees I had been using. So I kind of bought into it early and uh, it would be not until, uh, oh, when did I join the, the bee association or the breeders association? That was probably 2000 and uh, uh, 15 or 16 that I joined officially and uh, and it was really the the idea that we could breed for better bees that could resist some of these threats and uh, have more success and minimize the use of chemicals so what's the the, the Russian bee it's 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 considered a a strain not a race it's a strain talk a little bit about the where they come from and what makes a Russian bee a Russian bee yeah, well, uh, for for listeners who aren't familiar with the program, this started with uh, the researchers down at the Bee Lab in Baton Rouge, um, and uh, Tom Rinder was the the main person for this. But he he discovered that uh, uh, Russian bees that were in the Primorsky region of Russia, which is near Asia, um, had the mites uh, and uh, the Russian beekeepers didn't really do a lot for treatments. The mites seemed to be under control by the bees. And so in 1997, he finally got permission from the Russian and the U.S. governments to bring some of these queens for, in for testing and to see if they truly had these, uh, this uh, resistance or tolerance, as we refer to it. And um, he, they found it was, it was true. And, uh, and then they started uh, using, uh, doing field testing. In other words, they, they brought in Charlie Harper, Manley Bygalt, Hubert Tubbs, and a couple other uh, commercial beekeepers and uh, start, had them start using these bees. And they were counting mites uh, uh, to the point where, you know, the, these guys, when you talk to them, just, they, we just laugh because they talk about all the mite counting they did for 10 years. And from that, they took, uh, I forget the exact number, but it was, in the, it was in the 300 different genetic lines. And they, they brought it down to 17 or 18 of the best of those lines. And that's what we work with now. Um, and they, all the time they were counting the mites, they were basically looking for bees that were countering uh, varroa particularly. Because as I said, we, they never really had a problem with the tracheal mites. Um, so, uh, we have been since that time, since, uh, 97 and 2006 and seven, uh, the lab released these bees to the private sector, but before they released it, they wanted to, uh, make sure it went to a group that would 
not just let these bees die out and uh, through negligence, but have a, have a firm program that would continue the process of selection and, and basically improving the, the mite tolerance and other, other disease resistance and honey production. Uh, so we have expanded our scope quite a bit since those days. So uh, we've, you know, the program has been successful. It has done the things that the researchers had hoped it would do, and that is they, they have uh, us, us beekeepers, there's about 20 of us involved now, and um, we have uh, a relationship with each other that's mutually dependent, which makes this a unique program in itself. You can imagine a bunch of strong-willed beekeepers sitting around trying to come up with agreement on things. That's kind of our meetings are pretty, uh, pretty interesting for the observer. But um, we, uh, we've, we've seen steady incremental improvement. And, and, and like I remind people who talk to me about, oh, I want to get your Russian bees. I hear they don't get mites. Well, they do get mites. It's just that they're more forgiving. You can, you can apply treatments with far less uh, frequency. And uh, we have seen, uh, and, the, and the lab monitors all of this for us, and that's part of the requirements of being in the program. You have to submit certain data to them regularly. They have to pass DNA samples, your, your breeding stock. And uh, so uh, it, it, they've shown that we've, we've steadily uh, seen improvement in, in, the, in fewer and fewer mites being sampled as we've gone along and selected for better and better breeding stock. So the hope is that we will reach a point where mites, at least for our bees, will be uh, a smaller, smaller problem. And I think for some of us, it already is. We do have members who do not treat at all many years. They will uh, not need to. And, um, you know, it does does fluctuate, but it's uh, it's it's working in that regard. Um, The steady improvement. Uh, we've been selecting for honey production, so we've seen better honey production it's slowly, but it's coming up, uh, and that's one of the criteria we're looking for because we want these bees to be commercially viable, in other words, attractive to commercial uh, uh, bee operations. Uh, pollination, we've uh, found, done a lot of work on that as to how we can make these bees uh, at ready earlier for pollination of things like almonds and uh, other crops. Um, and, you know, and I think what makes our program unique is we have, uh, a per- have procedures that must be followed. And we're serious about our standards. If you not, don't follow the procedures, if you don't meet the standards, then you do not qualify to participate that year. Now, and these standards are for the breeders, not for the beekeepers who buy the queens, correct? Yeah, these are standards for the breeders. We have to we have to police ourselves, and uh, and sometimes that uh, becomes a challenge. I mean, I can tell you as uh, president, I'm often the uh, the referee because you know you get into some some disagreements about the best way to do some of these things. And as I said earlier, we have a we have a strong willed independent group of people in this group, so uh, makes it both exciting, but sometimes can be tr- tough to get to get things pushed along you know um so uh you know and i think what i wanted to point out is the things that make this program unique compared to other types of uh breeding programs that i'm aware of are that first of all each member is responsible to provide other members with with equally uh equally good queens for their part of the for their breeding of their queens in other words we provide drone source to each other that has to meet the same standards as the individual breeding lines we're working with. And uh, it's also done on, on a selection uh, evaluation every year. We do mite counts. Our mite counts are different from the average person because when we do a mite count, we would you do a wash and we count every single bee and every single mite and every single sample. That's what the lab wants. So you don't say, a cup is 300 bees, you count them and you find out you have 325, you know, and that's, a, so, so we do a lot of that. We do a lot of mite, uh, we have a lot of baggies in our freezers and our spouses put up with that nonsense, but uh, 
because it's a much easier thing to do on a cold day in the fall. But anyway, there's uh, there's a lot of things we do. And, and the final thing is we do what we call uh, uh, the DNA comparisons, which uh, Laney uh, Bourgeois from the lab does. And uh, that is, uh, is, is really key to this program as well. And it's, uh, it's called a POA, which is a, a probability of assignment. And that's really measuring the percentage of purity remaining in the offspring of the, uh, the breeding stock that we're using. So in other words, we would take samples of emerging uh, worker brood and we would uh, freeze that and send those samples down to Laney and she would run these tests and she would compare it to past to the original lines uh, for, for to basically verify that we haven't genetically strayed too far. And uh, that percentage also is an indication of how we're doing because when that, when we first started doing this, we had a much lower percentage of acceptability. We were looking at a, at a 55, 60% uh, elig- if your bees were at that level, uh, then that would be accepted. We've bumped it to 65% and now we're working at 75%. So we've increased the purity, which is another indication that it is possible to do a uh, free mated uh, system uh, that that actually improves the, uh, the, the uh, genetics of what we're working with. And that's actually been one of those things that was, you know, not always... Uh, uh, proven or known to be uh, possible. So, uh, and that would be the other thing that we do that's maybe different from other breeding programs is that we work with, with what we call a closed breeding program. We put probably more emphasis on our drone sources than we even do our breeding lines. We always work with breeding stock that has already been verified as, as the pure stock that we we want and the uh, genetic lines we want but of course as you know the the drone source uh, is is just as important and so we would send i would for example take I, i'm responsible for two of the breeding lines and i would send my queens to other be to the other members and they would use my queens to breed more drone source queens that they would use as drone source because they would, my queens would represent different genetic backgrounds uh, to theirs. Is that a more efficient way of doing it as opposed to artificial insemination? It's a better way to do it because as most studies show, um, free mated, free, free mated queens providing you have the, the dozen or more different drone sources available um, tend to last to live longer and are productive longer, and in in our case, we we have members who can do the instrumental insemination, but we are looking for a uh, a program that can be uh, utilized no matter what part of the country you're in, and and uh, and really look at it from the standpoint of uh, needing to provide uh, a lot of queens that you can, and of course, instrumental insemination can be a little bit more limited. Um, it's good for some purposes, and I won't say we won't ever use it. We can get into that if you want, but uh, it take a little time to discuss that part of the philosophy. But uh, basically, we don't do that at this time. And, and part of that is uh, by using the drone source uh, queens, those are also evaluated in the same way our breeding stock is evaluated. So when you're matching up drones that are carrying, you know, a hundred percent of their mother's genetics, who were also highly uh, mite tolerant and disease resistant and good honey producers, and you're combining them with, with our breeding queens uh, offspring or, or daughter queens, uh, then you're going to, uh, uh, reinforce the, those genetics in those bees for the next generation. And that's the goal. It's not without certain consequences. And this is why the evaluation is so important because you can also emphasize uh, or amplify characteristics that you may not really like too. So you have to be paying attention to that. Dan, it sounds like I'm going to interrupt you here for a second. It sounds like the Baton Rouge people really deserve a pat in the back to keep this going this long. 
they really have been really essential to this program. And uh, Lilia de Guzman is our representative at the lab since Tom retired. Uh, but she was certainly active before Tom retired, too. She's been a part of this program from the very beginning. And if you really look, there's lots of, uh, I was going to say, the other thing about these bees that I think anyone interested in Russian bees, uh, don't take my word for any of this. Uh, this has all been thoroughly researched. And there's more, more good science on these bees than I think any specific type of bee that I've seen. And it's all public publicly displayed. You can go to the uh, AR, ARS uh, USDA site and uh, just Google uh, or uh, search for Russian honeybees and they'll, you know, you'll pop up a hundred experiments and things. And if you just go to the, uh, our, our website, which is uh, uh, Russian, uh, Russianbreeders.org, there we have listed a whole bunch of stuff on there on their, the resistance uh, mechanisms for, of resistance, uh, tips on how to manage these bees that make that why they're different from other types of bees. And there's a lot of good information there. And you can certainly go to my warmcolorsapiary.com website. And I put up a lot of uh, how to uh, ID things that we've learned in, in our, our area. I'll make sure to put those links in on the, uh, the show notes too, for anybody who wants to read them. You bring up a good topic, Dan, and, and this is the one that usually rises to the top whenever you begin talking about this is what are the differences between Russians and, and I use the term carefully here, other bees, because there are so many other kinds of other bees. But if I, would, if I was going to look at a couple of three, four points, um, I'd like to hear the positive, but also I know there's some people anyway that think there's some negative points out there. And can you look at both of those? Yeah, I can. I mean, uh, you know, we, uh, as you know, you were at the Eastern Apicultural Society meeting in uh, Virginia, and uh, they were good enough to invite our group to put on a day-long program on queen rearing and the Russian bees. And uh, for the people who sat through that, they probably learned a great deal because we did have Tom Rinderer come and do an excellent uh, thing on the mechanisms of resistance and Lily de Guzman. And then I think the other members who spoke uh, are all pretty successful at in their particular areas. Uh, well, I mean, uh, I think the, the first thing about it is, you know, people always uh, go to hygienic behavior as, as the, the main uh, defense for uh, mites. And, uh, you know, we, we in this organization do not select bees for hygienic behavior. We don't do any of that. And the reason we don't is if you saw Tom's presentation, and this would be if you ever get him to talk on your show, you should ask him about this because it's, it's fascinating. There's about 12 things that the Russian bees do that reduce mite, mites in the hive. And it's not uh, it starts with uh, some, you know, we hear about the, the Purdue uh, mite biters. Okay, well, uh, we call that, we've been calling that uh, varroa sensitive grooming since the 90s, 1990s. It's been going on since the 90s. And you know who's the top of the list? Russian bees. And even uh, Greg Hunt had a chart I saw when he was up in Ontario, and he had Russian bees right up the top there when he was selecting for that stuff. So, so let's start there. Then you go to, uh, you know, uh, they do have the, you know, varroa sensitive hygiene, which is, of course, removing, uh, they'll detect in the brood cells, you know, that there's mites in on the uh, pupa and they'll remove that and take it out of the hive. So they'll reduce uh, mites that way before they grow up to become reproductive. And the other thing that, that Russian bees do that, that is unique to them, and maybe the Carniolans do this to some extent because they're, they're rapid spring buildup type bees too. And what happens is that the, the Russian bees in the spring build up slowly at first, and then they spike. And, the, and we see this. It's, it's phenomenal to watch because we will see a very small cluster of bees coming out of winter. Often you, you'll feel like, boy, those bees don't have, have a chance of doing anything. And a month later, you have, you know, eight, 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 ten frames of brood. And I mean solid brood. And then all of a sudden it starts hatching out. And that's where they get the re bad reputation of being swarmy. Well, if you keep bees and you have that many new bees hatching in that short of a time, you are going to have a swarm unless you're doing something about it. Uh, 
So I think that's more for us guys keeping these bees. We don't have those problems because we've adapted our management to that. But what I was going to say is what happens there is you have more healthy bees hatching than the existing mites can lay eggs in the uh, in the cells. So you actually have a large population of healthier adult bees hatching out or emerging, uh, and they, they sort of outrun the mites for a time. The other thing that they do that's also very, very important, and uh, we see this now because the people are writing about brood interruption, interrupt the brood cycle, and the mites will, if you have bees that, that remove mites, that'll that'll get some of the mites out of there. Well, these bees do this just automatically. If there's a dearth, and we see this often in our area in July, there just isn't a lot of nectar coming in and the pollen slows down. And you will see the, you will see the brood just back right down. The queen sometimes, and, and when we had all this, we had hot, humid, 90 degree stretches this year, and we saw queens just stop laying eggs altogether. They interrupted the brood on their own. And during that, because these bees are so good at removing and grooming mites from each other, those populations dropped. And we could see that because we're sampling before and after all the time. We were we sample once a month and we were seeing this pattern. And uh, so there's there's a lot of things these bees do. We ha- The other phenomena that these bees have is that they have a uh, uh, they actually have a, a lower level, uh, a lower mite population growth. In other words, um, they seem to inhibit uh, mite reproduction. So there's some of that going on. We don't even know why, but we know that comb that they make has certain characteristics, pheromones probably, uh, that actually inhibit mites from reproducing. So there's like all these things that come together, and uh, it, it's really, uh, uh, you know, uh, Tom's presentation ought to be put on film or something because uh, it's probably one, well, it's one of the most thorough explanations of how bees basically defend themselves and protect themselves from diseases and, and pests. And, uh, and, and he shows, and, and by the way, the, the, the tricky part to all of this is that this isn't one thing going on. It's like this inter- interaction that's happening all over the place all the time. I like seeing a lot of pre- a lot of different pressures simultaneously being put on mice, but I got to go back to the beginning of what you said. The thing that I like, I like the mite part without a doubt. I mean, that's 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 at the top of the pile. But I'll tell you the other thing that I like, and this is just just is just me here. But you're you're those bees don't don't aren't like uh, Italians, which have populations all all the time, and carniolans, which explode in the spring. These guys are a little bit slower in the spring, and so am I. <laughs> And and I'm on the road, and yeah, you know yeah. I, my weather's variable, and that they're not taken off in the end of February is to me a blessing because I'm not taken off with it. So if you're in a position as a as a beekeeper, that that could be an advantage. Certainly keep it because it has served me well since mm-hmm. I started doing bees. But yeah, and, and and you know that that is the stuff that you learn to use these bees for you you can make them work with you for example uh during that dearth period i was talking about you know one of the observations all of us have made that keep these bees is our our yards are totally quiet during those times the bees just kind of are mellow they just kind of slow down and uh, they don't do a lot and it's always interesting to me um you know the uh so the the mites we know we we we've done lots of work with uh, uh, the thing I like about these bees is we're going into winter now and I used to I used to uh, agonize over the size of my hives for winter always thinking I needed two deep boxes of honey and bees well um, if you've got six six or seven frames of bees with these Russians right now and you give them thirty five pounds of honey. Uh, and they're healthy, and they have a have a good queen. They, they'll be there in the spring. Uh, you don't wow. need, you don't need extraordinary numbers. What I tell everybody, the goal is to have a box, a, a deep box of ten frames of bees, and a medium f- super of of honey on top. <laughs> if you can do that, those bees have all they need. I've not seen we we've wintered these bees in five frame nukes more times than I can tell you with four frames of honey and an open comb in the center. And we just fill the box up with bees and we put in more bees than, 
than seem to fit. And that seems to work just fine. And you may have to feed them in late spring, but they really don't eat a lot of honey. It's amazing to us. Well, I was going to say the other thing I would tell you about these bees that I find to be phenomenal and, uh, and I don't have a good explanation. Whenever I ask the researchers and stuff, they never give me, a, they don't seem to have a good explanation. But during that rapid brood buildup, you will open these hives and you will look on the frames and where you, usually you see double layers of Italian bees covering that brood in the spring. You will see bees walking around and you can see the brood clearly. In other words, it's a thin layer of workers maintaining eight, 10 frames of brood. It doesn't look like there's enough bees there to do the job. And when it gets cold and you sort of say, gee, I'm going to lose brood with chilling and so forth, that just doesn't seem to happen. They seem to deal with it. And they're very good with colder temperatures and colder weather. My apple growers like my bees because they fly at cooler temperatures. You know, I shouldn't probably say this, but, you know, at EAS, I was a little bit dis discouraged to hear some of my... Uh, long-time friends uh, disparaging our Russian program and, and our bees. And they were saying things that just, frankly, just weren't the case. You know, one is the swarming. Well, um, you know, I'm sorry, but if you do this for a living, you, uh, you, you do a lot of splits, you do a lot of nukes, you do a lot of uh, using those bees that are growing so fast that they're going to swarm. In other words, you don't let them get to that swarmy point. You manage them for optimum levels of population at the key times, which for us is when we do pop pollination and when we do our honey flow, which is mid-May to June, and then again in August. But in between, we, uh, we actually break these hives down quite a lot, and we pull a lot of brood out of them to both feed our our queen operation and to make up nukes to sell. So uh, if you're doing that, you don't have a swarm problem. You're actually just use, using those bees for other purposes. Sounds like you're having a beekeeper problem. Yeah. Well, I, I, I you know, I always tactfully like to say, you know, it, to me, it is a, it is a management issue. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I'm not saying I never lose a swarm. Of course I do. Yeah. But uh, I can tell you one thing. We, we, we can, we know how to counter that and we know what has to be done. And it, and it means you have to get into your bees and you have to do those things. And guess what? If you're, if you're a backyard beekeeper, Keeper, that's the problem with beekeeping. You either you have too few bees or too many, but you never have the number you really want. So if you want two beehives and you're successful, you're going to have four, and and so you got to decide how you're going to going to handle that. But you can't just let those sit in the box till yeah. they swarm. So, yeah. So that's one. I mean, uh, requeening. There's always been this thing about requeening, say an Italian colony with the Russian, and and you know we. Uh, I used to believe that to be true until I worked with Carl Webb and Carl showed me how you pretty much get 99% success. And, and Kim, I think you always say this too, is, you know, uh, put that queen in there and leave her in for five days before you let them release her. And uh, by then, usually they're going to accept her. And you also learn from experience that when you put that cage on those frames, that behavior that those bees exhibit towards that cage are going to tell you a lot right off the bat. So you, uh, you kind of proceed carefully. Um, the honey production, it was, I remember people telling me, oh, you'll never get any honey from, from uh, Russian bees. Well, I got to tell you, everybody else who's complaining about no honey need to come over here. And I think it's a bad year for us, but we got, you know, we're still pulling out. Our average this year is still going to be a hundred pounds of hive. Oh, in Massachusetts. Is, in Massachusetts, yeah. which used to be, by the way, when I had really good bees in the past, it was 60. Yeah. <laughs> so, so don't tell me you can't improve honey production. Point is, there's no, no, no reason these bees can't produce all the honey you want. Um, and, of course, uh, the other big one that we often get is the aggressiveness. Uh, the Russians are, are aggressive. Um, but I have to tell you that that uh, I, I don't see them as any worse than any other bees I've kept. Uh, to me, if you keep a lot of bees, you always have a few bees that are hot. They're going to be hot. Well, the other, I'm going to interrupt you here, Dan, because you raise a good point. And, and it's one thing that I always try and stress. Uh, you're dealing with what you call pure Russian bees. You've gotten them from a Russian breeder. And way too often when people get a Russian hybrid, 
you run into that aggressiveness then into that hot problem. And I've seen that again and again and again is mm-hmm. a Russian hybrid yes. is, is the nasty second cousin uh, uh, of a uh. pure Russian. So if you're looking at doing this, keep that in mind. If you want a Russian hybrid that does some things, but you're going to probably get something that's going to be a little bit on the testy side. And then, and that's unfortunately, I think that's probably more the experience some people have. They have a swarm of Russian bees that leave with the mother queen, and uh, they successfully raise a replacement daughter, and she mates with whatever you have in the neighborhood, and uh, and there's no control there. Now we're controlling what we're doing, and I think that you know, and that and that's that whole question of hybrid vigor. Most of us are familiar with the idea that. A lot of times when you make these crosses, uh, particularly between the different races of bees, you, some, you often get a desirable hybrid figure that uh, uh, they're more productive, they're more uh, better populations, uh, things like that. But hybrid vigor can also go the other way. You can get more aggressiveness. You can get uh, uh, bees that don't produce honey. You can get other things that aren't desirable. So there's a question of that. And by the way, Look at Lilia de Guzman's uh, study of hybrid Russian stock. She did it two years ago. It's, I think it uh, can be found on the website. And she really, she, she basically, she bought queens from various uh, pr- producers and did a comparative study for a year. They, they studied these, all these different uh, lines for a year. And uh, she didn't come out and say every one of these lines was terrible, but she, she did say that they didn't la- they lacked a lot of the, certainly the mite, the mite tolerance that our bees have. And in some cases, they just didn't do anything particularly useful, uh, except get sick and die. So, so, <laughs> so there's a lot of things you want to pay attention to. And I think that's one of the misunderstandings that, uh, that the general beekeeping public has about these Russian bees and the Russian Honey Bee Breeders Association. We're working with a very special group of bees, and uh, and a big part of our our, our mission is uh, maintaining those genetics. In other words, we don't want our bees to deteriorate into something less than they already have become. We want them to go the other direction and uh, become a better bee that 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 serve beekeepers in a better way. So. Just the aggressiveness, I would say this about the bees. Uh, we find, uh, I find the, that most of my Russians, uh, there's certain times when, and I would say this is characteristic of, of any bee, uh, during dearths, uh, you don't want to be open in hives with honey and get robbing started. That's going to make any bee yard an ugly place to be. Uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, when, queen, when hives are queenless, they're, they're often very aggressive. So there's often other symptoms. Uh, these are often the aggressiveness. If you look cl- more closely, you're going to find uh, are symptoms of other things going on around that hive or in that hive. Sometimes you'll see that with heavy mite loads. I've noticed that, that, that when we have had mite issues, um, they tend to be more uh, more defensive. So uh, aggressiveness to me is 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 kind of a uh, both a handling how you handle your bees as well as uh, uh, paying attention to the conditions. You know, you don't go out there in the middle of a downpour and and open that hive. You know, it's just common sense sometimes. And and just the, and just the last thing I'd mention is, and I, I find this to be uh, another one of those things. And, and Tom said this. Uh, Again, at, he got asked this question at at, uh, at EAS, and that is the question of American fowl brood. These bees do not get American fowl brood. Now, how cool is that? That's like that's like the and, and you know somebody asked him straight out, "Well, what's all this nonsense about them being uh, resistant to fowl brood?" And Tom said, "Well, he said we've not found a case of fowl brood in these bees so far. <laughs> that's what. So he's still." You know, and, uh, you know, so that's, that's a pretty, a pretty good thing. So there's things about these bees that we haven't really even discovered yet or really uh, studied. Yet. So a lot more work that can be done. And I guess the, the, the big piece that I keep, uh, and Tom has said this to us as a group, um, you know, these bees represent the most diverse genetics we have currently. Yeah. And that's because, and as Tom Said at one point, he says that's why the maintenance of the genetics is so important. So he says we don't want to screw these up like we have other 
other types of, of livestock and bees. So, so, uh, so I, I take that as a, uh, a very serious, uh, you know, point is, is, you know, we, this is one of the reasons these bees do well is that they do have a lot more potential still in their, their genetics. And, uh, and some of the stuff Steve Shepard and people like that have done have sort of shown that there's been a steady, uh, you know, not a quick bottleneck, but there's certainly uh, less and less diversity among the, the breeding stocks on the east and west coast. So if you take that into consideration, you know, we, we need to, as beekeepers, look at this and, and start taking that a little more seriously, too. If I'm a beekeeper sitting here in, say, Olympia, Washington, for example, just pulled it right out of the air, <laughs> and I'm thinking, I want, I want to get into, these, these sound like uh, Bill Hesbach the other day had a great term for this, the queen of my dreams. <laughs> and it sounds like the perfect bee to have. Yeah, okay. Uh, so how would I, a backyard beekeeper, get a hold of some Russian bees? Well, the easiest way to start is to go visit the Russian honey breeders uh, website and see who's near you and... Get a hold of them in the middle of the winter and let them know you're interested in getting some of their queens. Um, you know, one of the things I uh, I wanted to get into a little bit was you know the the challenges of this program and some of the things that aren't happening that need to happen. And um, you know, and that's uh, always a little tricky because I don't want to give people a, a ne- any kind of negative impression because I think what we're what we're accomplishing has been been pretty good but to get the get those bees i think uh you you know there's there's somebody in most parts of the country let me just talk a little bit about who the members are because i wanted to you know we've mentioned the bee lab and the bee lab is actually one of our voting members they send a representative to our annual meetings just like any apiary would and when we talk about the process of being a certified breeding member We're not talking about an individual person. We're talking about the apiary that that person either owns or represents. So in other words, when we're certifying uh, a breeding line, we're saying that that apiary uh, uh, has passed all of our Ex, has has passed our tests and our expectations and met our met our standards. So uh, you know we will have sometimes brothers, uh, husband and wife teams, uh, individuals, and uh, and so it's 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 not that you're certifying every single queen you're selling. And I guess that's my point. We're basically saying that that apiary is capable of producing uh, pure certified breeding stock. And that's that's where it all starts. So, what do you see as the uh, Russian queen breeders' greatest challenge over the next three to five years? Probably our biggest challenge with this group: we lack qualified members that can do this work. And this is the big thing we go round and round about at our, at our annual meetings. We all know we need a lot of members, and here's why we need more members. We have 17 lines we currently work with. Each member is assigned two of those lines. And other members would have also the same two lines. So there's some redundancy put in or built in. And that's a good thing because when somebody up north has a setback in the winter and loses a couple of those breeding queens, you can call somebody uh, in, in another state that's got your lines and say, can you send me out a couple of yours so that I don't lose the season, you know. And, uh, and that's really important. However, there's a limit to how many queens each of us can produce to send to each other. So if you're sending out, on, on average, four or six queens to, to 20 other members, they get first dibs, and you've got to send all those out off, off the top. So you're really working with 100 queens right off the, right, right off the bat before you get too far. Um, and some of the lines, such as my two lines, I'm the only member currently maintaining those two lines. So I feel very uh, vulnerable in some cases because if my, lo- if my number of, of qualified breeders drops too low, because you always lose something in the winter, um, then I'm at risk. I don't want to be the guy who goes down in, his- in the Russian beekeeping history as the guy who lost the genetic lines. You know, <laughs> That's not the goal I have in mind. Dan, I got, I got to interrupt you here for a second. We're, we're, we're running low on time and I got I got two quick questions. One is you've kind of answered it. Go to the webpage. What was the webpage again? Your webpage? 
Mine, mine is warmcolorsapiary.com. Okay, and, the, and then the Russian Queen Breeders is, is russianbreeders.org. Okay, so if I want to be a breeder, I'm sitting out here listening to this. You know, it's something I want to get involved in, maybe not uh, this year, but I at least want to start exploring it. Is that where I go to get information to that web page? Yes, yes. And there's a lot of good information there on both. If, if you're just thinking of using these bees, that gives you some tips on management. Uh, it gives all the, all the, the research that has been done that you can read for yourself. Uh, it has a list of the members who currently sell okay. bees. Uh, it has a lot of good information mm -hmm. there. And it has contact information for people to, to okay. follow. Okay. Well, that's, that's <clears throat> excuse me, that's what people are going to want to know. Where can I get these? Mm -hmm. You got that on the webpage or from you. Yeah. And how can I get involved in this association? And I think the message here today is, I think you brought out everything, everything I wanted to hear. And what I liked hearing mostly today, Dan, was that there's a lot more people involved now than there were three years ago when you guys came up to Medina. This is true. This is true. We're, sl we're growing slowly. But you have to remember, too, we, we have some older guys in the group. They're, we're yep. also retiring every year. Somebody retires yep. every year. And uh, so uh, we're still we're still kind of only replacing people as they leave. So we need we need a lot of young blood. We need new blood that's going to be in in the group for long, the long haul to really develop this program um, and take over the leadership at, at some point. I mean, I got voted in as president for a second term, but. In all honesty, in all honesty, uh, everybody else has taken their turn. <laughs> it's kind yeah. of like, you know, we got not some, uncommon, not yeah, uncommon, know, you know, and I, I don't mind doing it. Don't get me wrong. But, uh, you know, it's it's just sort of like, you know, there's there's a lot of a lot of opportunities here. And yep. And, and I think the difficulty I was just going to throw one last thing. One of the challenges our group has is simply this. We need people who already understand how to raise queens. And I'm not talking about thousands of queens, but they should be capable of raising hundreds of queens. And then we can help you become a breeder of queens. But you have to sort of have the prerequisite skills to come into this group. Uh, and that's been a little bit of a struggle. We do have interest, but we often have interest from people who don't have enough background in queen rearing. And, uh, you know, I think there's the good news about that is I think there's more interest out there among in the bee community for people to do more of that. So maybe we'll see uh, more potential uh, members for the future. And, uh, and at least that's my hope, because I think this is a program, by the way, that can be applied, uh, even if it's not strictly for the Russians. The whole breeding program makes good sense for anyone who's a geneticist or somebody who, who is raising uh, queens on a larger scale to get better yeah. results with their bees generally. So, so it makes a lot of sense, and it could be shared in a lot of different ways. I like, I like, hearing, I like hearing the fact that there's, there's multiple levels of skill and dedication required because when you come out of it on top, what you're getting is the top-line bee, and, and I'm not seeing that a whole lot of other places. So, Dan, we got to run. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I really appreciate you being here today. I, I like I said, I think I'm probably your one of your fiercest advocates on this program and on these bees. And uh, you, you, uh, you have been very good to us, Kim, and and everybody in the association knows it. We, we well, uh, know you've always reason. spoke well for us, and uh, that's much appreciated. There, and there's good reason, and you just explained all of the reasons that uh, that I think. Russians need more attention. Jeff, I think we're about ready to wrap this up today. Dan, again, thank you. What's that thank webpage you. one more time, Dan? Warmcollarsapiary.com. And the other one? Russian, Russian Breeders with an S dot org. Okay, good. There you, that's where you go, folks, to get more information. Get a hold of Dan. He is more than happy to help you get started on this or to give you more information. There you go, folks. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, Dan. Really appreciate you taking time this afternoon to, to be with us on the Beekeeping Today podcast. And been my pleasure. I'm sorry the time is so short. All right. All right. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. Bye. All right. Well, that was fun. I hadn't, I did not know that about Russian bees and, and um, really makes me wonder why more people aren't using them. That's a good question. Well, the, 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 the points that Dan brought up, of course, were 
the biggest point that people seem to have is that they don't wake up really early in the spring. Mm. And that can be an issue if you're looking for an early honey flow. But other than that, I, I knew pretty much what he was uh, going to talk about, uh, Jeff. And, and I'm really glad he brought up all of those points, some positive points. I don't want to say negative points, but things to consider when it comes to management. Yeah. Because you got to change. Yep. Um, in fact, Jeff, I was at a meeting last this last Saturday, and um, I'm talking to a group of people here in, in, in Ohio about wintering. And one of the things I mentioned was the Russian bee, and I asked if anybody had Russians. And one guy in, in the in the crowd had all Russians. That's all he had. And I said, what do you like about them? And he said, they winter well. And I said, what don't you <laughs> like about them? And he says, they swarm like mad. And I looked at him and I said, that's the beekeeper's fault, right? And he said, darn tootin'. Oh, <laughs> that's good. So, so that was good to hear. I mean, he was at least, he was managing Russians like he used to manage Italians. And, mm -hmm. and it just doesn't work. But. Other than that, I'm, I'm, an, I'm a, like I said, a strong advocate of these bees, of this association. And if you're listening and you want to try some, go to their, go to their webpage, uh, RussianBreeder.org. Find a breeder near you or at least find one that you can work with and try some next year. Knowing now what, what you can expect, they're going to be a little bit later. Uh, and then when they go, they go really fast. So you've got to be on top of things. We're going to make a better beekeeper out of you, I think. Besides the fact that you're going to put a lot of less stuff in your hives and they make honey and they winter well. So, Jeff, I think I think Dan summed it up pretty well. I don't think I can add much to this at all. And, and uh, I'm glad we were able to get him. Real good, Kim. Hey, you know what we have this week? Uh, we have a question from a listener and it was posted on the website to uh, Tom Theobald from a couple episodes ago on the Neonix question. So uh, I called up Tom, read him the question, and uh, he had a reply. So let's uh, listen to that now. Well, we have on the phone today uh, right now with Tom Theobald, and we had a question come into the website directed to Tom on his uh, episode on the problem with neonicotinoids. And this question comes in from Gattelheck Gabir, and I apologize, Gettleheck, for if I uh, butchered your name. But uh, here is uh, uh, Gettleheck's question to Tom. How come I do not find more than 20 parts per billion in honey and way less than that in the trap pollen in Arizona? Question mark. So, Tom, uh, can you give us a, a reply to that? Yeah, that's... that's uh a very important point that he raises and it it gets to some of the confusion that we have with these neonicotinoid pesticides they operate under a completely different set of rules and in in the world of toxicology we got to kind of get off into the weeds a little bit here but in the world of toxicology the mantra for generations has been uh, the dose makes the poison. And the argument is that there are many things that you consume every day or you're exposed to every day that in small quantities are harmless or even beneficial. Uh, salt is often used as an example. A little bit of salt doesn't hurt you, but too much salt can be fatal. And water, the same thing. And I've heard industry apologists making that very uh statement that the dose makes the poison but the neonicotinoids are a family of pesticides that that are the effect is cumulative and irreversible and because of that a principle called the dose time response is how the poison works and and that originated in the early 1900s with a scientist by, by the name of Haber and is referred to as Haber's rule, and it had to do with toxic gases. And then when we began to do a lot of cancer research, one of the things that emerged was the effect of carcinogens that followed Haber's rule, and that is that small amounts over time can lead to the same endpoint, which is death or disability. You just accumulate the damage over time. And that's the dose time response. And that's how the neonicotinoids work. And quite ironically, a, a fraction of what might be a chronic dose 
given a sufficient amount of time and administered regularly can lead to death, very small amounts. So that's part of it. The other part is we confuse weight with toxicity, and that's part of the deception. We're told that certain um, number of pounds of a certain chemical are used, and I've, I've used the comparison of rocks and nuclear warheads, both weapons, but you wouldn't compare them by weighing them, and that's no longer a way to measure these pesticides. So let's take a look at the neonicotinoids. We used uh, DDT as a reference point, and the highest usage of DDT was 1959 of 80 million pounds. Even though the uh, only reported poundage is 10 million, it's actually 40 million, but that's still half the poundage of DDT. But remember, they're five to 10,000 times more toxic for the lower level life forms than DDT, and their effect is cumulative and irreversible. So small doses over time can be just as lethal as larger doses at once. 20 parts per billion is actually quite high in the honey. And it sounds like uh, the commenter is a researcher, so he'll understand what I'm saying, I think. Uh, 20 parts per billion, it seems like a very small amount. When I said in the, in the podcast that it was the toxic equivalent of 200 to 400 billion pounds of DDT, it's the difference between poundage and toxicity. And tox toxic, the toxic effect is really how these chemicals should be reported. But in any event, uh, the EPA recently has established environmental thresholds, the point at which damage commences. And for imidacloprid, the first of the neonicotinoids, that threshold is 0 0.01 parts per billion. For clothianidin, another of the most widely used neonicotinoids, it's one part per billion. That's the point at which damage begins. So that honey with 20 parts per billion neonicotinoids that's fed to a colony over time will poison that colony under, under the Haber's rule of, of accumulated effect. So I would suggest that people do a couple of things. The first person to really broach this subject was Hank Tenneke's, uh, toxicologist from Holland, and he wrote a small book in 2010 called A, a Disaster in the Making, and that's a good place to start. Um, another of the researchers who has looked at this dose-time response is Francisco Sanchez Bayo, B-A-Y-O, and people can Google him up and they can do a little research on their own. But I would, uh, I would respond to the commenter that 20 parts per billion is a very large amount given the characteristics of this family of chemicals. Well, thank you, Tom. Um, just to recap then uh, for uh, uh, <laughs> Cadillac, Garber, Gaber, that it's a combination of the cumulative and uh, it's cumulative and irreversible and, and it's toxicity over poundage. So thank you, Tom, for your explanation and, and reply. And uh, we look forward to having you back on the show to talk, talk to us a little bit more about the, the neonic problem. Yeah, I'm going to go put a little more wood in the wood stove and uh, go out and feed the chickens, I guess. <laughs> okay. Just a nice fall day. Very good. Thanks a lot, Tom. Bye-bye. Thank you, Jeff. I'm glad Tom was able to get back to that uh, listener and um I thought it was a pretty thorough answer. And, and of course, we're going to get Tom and some of his other uh, people with us again down the road because this subject isn't closed and it needs more explanation. But all things considered, I think that about wraps it up today, Jeff. We want to thank Larry Connor and Wick Wash Press, publisher of dozens of how-to and scientific beekeeping books, for sponsoring today's podcast with Dan Conlon. You can find out more about Wick Wash at www.wickwash.com. Take a look at their newest publications and give, give Larry Connor a high five for bringing all of us this, this great program today. We appreciate 
Larry's contributions to the show. All right. Well, that makes a, a complete show for us to, this week, uh, Kim, with uh, with uh, Dan and uh, the replies. And uh, I think it's a good show. One more thing before we go, Jeff. I want to. I want to just. Um, we've got. We've got this event in uh, Medina in October every year. This year, it's called My Story. We've got four very successful commercial beekeepers coming in. They each get a half a day to tell us their story. Mm -hmm. And what our next podcast is going to be, Jeff, is a summary of each of their stories. Of course, it's not going to take two days. It's going to take an hour. But we'll miss we'll miss some of the fine points. But uh, I'm I'm sitting in the wings taking notes, and and we'll uh, give share some of those with you. Uh, next time we come back, we come back. And then after that on deck, but not mm-hmm. scheduled so far, <laughs> Sam Ramsey is going to be talking about his work with, with, uh, with Varroa mites and fat bodies. And we've Great. got, um, what was the other one we were talking about? Jeff, I forget. Lundgren. Jonathan Lundgren is coming up, uh, shortly after that too. And he's got two things going on that that we're going to want to explore one of them of course is the health of soil and insect control and the use of pesticides in cornfields oh wow it's a it's a really neat relationship and he's discovered some pretty good things real good i i wanted to ask you before we go uh who's gonna who are those four beekeepers in the my story in a couple weeks oh we got some we got some all-stars here uh jeff i got john miller from north dakota brett 80 from from california Michael Palmer from Vermont and Ray Oliveras from California, the biggest queen breeder in the universe. I think it's going to be a good two days and we're going to boil it down to an hour. All right. Well, that wraps it up for a long, long week for us. Thanks, Kim. Thank you, Jeff. It's been a good, it's been a good week, but I'm kind of glad it's over. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll, we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Take care. <laughs>